Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Mary Owen, Associate Dean of Native American Health and Director of the Center for American Indian and Minority Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School. I'm also a family physician for the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And I'm your host on, on tonight's program on women's health and female cancers. The success of this program is very dependent on you, the viewer, so please call in your questions or email them to ask at wdse.org. The telephone numbers can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Michael Cassine, an OBGYN specialist with Essentia Health, Dr. Krishna Kolandival, a hematologist oncologist with St. Luke's Regional Cancer Center, and Dr. Addie Vittorio, a family medicine physician with St. Luke's Mount Royal Medical Clinic. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are Rebecca Jacobs of Asante, Minnesota, Emily Clark from Ivanhoe, Minnesota, and Andy Ledesma from Danube, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on women's health and female cancers. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank you I told you we got one question early, so I'm gonna ask whoever wants to jump forward. I think Dr. Colin Dival, you answered it earlier. If you have dense breast tissue, should you opt for an annual ultrasound or MRI versus a 3D mammogram? Yeah, so dense breast tissue is something we see commonly. Uh, usually the first line of screening is just 3D mammograms, mm -hmm. but one caveat is 3D mammograms are not good in dense breast tissue. It can miss small cancers. So sometimes we recommend an MRI, but with MRI the problem is sometimes the insurance don't cover it. So at that time we just stick with dense breast tissue, but we are a bit more aware with doing clinical breast exams. Same for all of you. Yeah, and I would say that I, I think both hospitals, at least in this area, have specialists who are willing to have a consult and talk with patients about their mammograms and their dense breast tissue or their family history and give recommendations that may further support insurance coverage of those things. Okay, so women aren't out of luck if they don't have that good insurance then. Yeah. Talk to your primary doctor. Okay, yeah. true. And if usually you can get it covered. Yeah, if they have like a strong family history, or any inheritable like high risk gene mutations like BRCA, then they will be eligible for MRI. It will be more, much more easier to get an MRI. We, we mentioned at the beginning of the show before uh, we started here that post COVID we are seeing higher rates of advanced cancer presentation or people um, coming in uh, a little bit further ahead in the cancer than they had been before COVID. And that's something that you're all seeing? How yeah. About, oh, go ahead. I, I think the, the biggest difference is that people have delayed screening and whether that's a mammogram or a colonoscopy, a uh, pap smear HPV testing, um, you know, people just haven't been to the doctor in, in several years. And, and that lack of screening is what I think has been the cause of it. Dr. Vittorio, any yeah, women's health conditions Yeah, and I would add with women's health, I mean, a lot of the things I'm seeing in, in my practice are that women have been over 50, have gone through menopause, and then they have a bleed that they don't call their doctor about or tell anyone about. And, and any bleeding after menopause should be evaluated. Um, and so we're seeing people who maybe said, well, two years ago I had this, but now it happened again. That's kind of scary. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. So the answer is get in if you have questions, especially if you've been waiting post-COVID. Anything to add to that, Dr. Colin Dival? Yeah, no, that's true. Actually, last year when, before vaccines were available and when everything started ramping up, we saw a lot of advanced presentation of cancer. But now I think everywhere with all the vaccines, screening is back on track. And so now it has calmed down better. Okay. Are you fearful with, uh, you know, there's reports of us getting you know, more strains of COVID and causing a backlog again or causing people to be afraid for again or any recommendations to your patients? Or? I, uh, I was here about 15 months ago and the recommendation was to get a vaccine and the recommendation is still to get a vaccine. So um, I think the landscape of COVID has changed significantly. Um, you know, a, a virus just isn't gonna kill everybody because then it dies too. So as the virus mutates and changes, um, you know, we have to make sure that we are staying up on on vaccination and, you know, hopefully we will never need to go back into the universal masking and distancing and, and that stuff um, because it has been a different disease for the last six months. So hopefully people will know that they can come out and, and get the health care that they need. Yeah, and I would say that, I mean, just anticipate that you might wait, you know, a couple of weeks longer for your mammogram. You might wait still because of mainly staffing issues right now, um, you know, to get in with your doctor or with your specialist just because we are short on wor the workforce just like every other industry. 
Dr. Colin Dival, in general, though, rates of cancer, uh, many, many cancers are increasing. That's true, yes. So thoughts on that or recommendations? Any, what is that? What are you talking with patients so about? That is all across the board. And mm -hmm. even now we are seeing cancers in more younger people. Recently, I saw like the colon cancer is like more, uh, we, we are finding people more in like 30 to 50 age group. And uh, I think a lot of factors, uh, one is like an environmental, more pollution, uh, pesticides and these kind of things are associated, but it's never like a very clear cut uh, direct correlation. Then a diet, uh, people are in general, the obesity rates are high, so that plays a very big role. Physical activity in general has decreased, more stress. So all these things are contributing and we d it's definitely true that we do see a lot of cancers. All right, we have so a whole a lot of questions now. What are, um, Dr. Uh, Vittoria, what are some concerning signs and symptoms for endometriosis? And how do I talk to my doctor about these concerns? Yeah, and feel free to jump in, Mike, when you <laughs> need to. But en endometriosis, I mean, there is sometimes a family history of the disorder. Um, and endometriosis is a proliferation of some of the menstrual tissue. And it's, there's a couple theories on it, but um, it's felt to be sort of outside the uterus where it's normally shed. Um, and so symptoms might be very painful, very heavy menstrual cycles, significant bowel or bladder complaints kind of associated with that. I mean, I've had people come in who say that when they get their period, they faint on a regular basis because of pain or other issues. Mm -hmm. And so that's usually a disease of menstruating women because of how it occurs. Um, and you would check with your OBGYN or your primary doctor um, and they would give you kind of recommendations for going about testing. Sometimes there is not a lot of testing that is done in younger patients and sometimes there is testing that may involve a laparoscopy or visualizing sort of the other organs and the pelvic organs. So they ask about how do you talk with your doctor about it and it's basically just tell your doctor your symptoms. Yeah, I'm having problems with my period, here's what's going on. And, and you know, we always have a series of questions we ask about how often, what's it like, what's your family history like. And the main thing is just to talk to your doctor yep. and they'll know the questions to ask. Absolutely, I mean, pain with uh, intercourse, uh, difficulty getting pregnant, so infertility, um, along with what Dr. Victoria said is, it's very common and endometriosis, especially in the OBGYN clinic, is something that we deal with every day. And every OBGYN has it on the front of their mind in the younger patient. So just come in and talk to your doctor. And if it's treated early, I mean, you can prevent some of those things like the fertility related issues. Dr. Cassing, what signs and symptoms should I be concerned about for breast cancer? So, you know, the, the breast cancer uh, diagnosis is, is, it's usually always either from a screening mammogram or uh, they find a lump. And traditionally it was the patient found a lump um, in her own breast. Um, depending on what recommendation you look at, people aren't uh, recommending the clinical breast exam or self breast exam. Um, but certainly a lot of breast cancers have been found by patients in the shower. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any changes in your breast, pain, um, you know, changing in the skin, redness, uh, anything like that, be sure to come in. So that's kind of the, the biggest change from baseline is really what, what people notice. Yeah, so I think- o the Or it's found asymptomatically on imaging. Yeah. And the biggest thing is if you're under 40, know what your breasts are normally, you know, even if you're not necessarily doing a regular self breast exam. And if you're of the age, you know, 35, 40, there's different organizations who give different recommendations. Start doing your monthly breast exam. Remind yourself to do that. Set your phone once a month. And don't be embarrassed to talk to your doctor about any of this. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Dr. Vittorio again, what age or when should I start in going in for gynecological exams? That sort of varies depending on your situation. So a gynecologic exam is, is kind of a general term. Um, mm -hmm. When we talk about doing um, you know, having someone look, it may depend on whether you're sexually active. So if you're sexually active and you're having issues, um, pain, discharge, other things, you would go in before sort of the recommended age of 21 for all women to have their first pap smear. And a pap smear is different than just a gynecological exam. A pap smear is where we take a speculum, we put it inside the vagina, we take a, a brush that kind of scrapes the skin cells off of the cervix, which is a little donut shaped organ at the end of the vagina. And we take those cells in for sampling with our pathologist or with a machine. Um, those cells at that area are particularly sensitive to disease 
disease and the disease that we're looking for is HPV and some of the things it can cause is dysplasia or abnormal cells or in more advanced cases, cervical cancer. So that should start at 21 in all women. And HPV is human papillomavirus. Yes. Thank you very much, that's great. Um, Dr. Colin Dival, what are the screening options for breasts? We got a big one here, breast, ovary, and uterine cancers. <laughs> so for breast cancer, it's like 3D mammogram. Now mm -hmm. that is the, it's better than 2D mammogram and all institutions now offer it. Uh, for ovary, unfortunately, we don't have any reliable screening tests. Uh, and for uterine, it's mainly symptoms because with uterine cancer, the first symptom would be like bleeding, uh, like Dr. Vittorio told, like postmenopausal bleeding is uh, definitely a red flag. So even though we don't have screening for uterine cancer, uh, we can pick, pick those things early with uh, if, if the postmenopausal bleeding is checked immediately. And, and uh, the one thing I would add about the ovarian cancer is that traditionally it was thought to be quote unquote a silent killer. And, and really it's not a silent situation in general, it's a non-specific. So it might be that someone has acid reflux or they have bloating or they have pain uh, and it doesn't go away if they take Tums or they take ibuprofen or you know if they avoid foods that they think are causing their symptoms. Uh, and the patients when they ultimately di I diagnose, if you talk to them, they'll say, oh, I've been having this for a year, I've been having this for eight months. And, and so really I think as Dr. Pretorio mentioned, with the breast, just knowing your body and knowing, hey, this is different. Something is different than, you know, I used to have acid reflux and take a medication that went away and now it's not. Um, knowing that something has changed is, is usually the first step. Excellent, that's such a great point. Anything to add, Dr. Pretorio? Yeah, and I think if you're not getting kind of what you're looking for, feel free to, you know, see someone's partner or check out another clinic because, I mean, there's no harm in looking if you really feel that you are there, there's something going on. And women historically in medicine have not been well listened to regarding complaints um, for various reasons. So it's important to sort of work with your physician and find someone who you feel listens. Thank you. Dr. Vittorio, back to you. I'm under 18 or, uh, or over 18, but still on my parents' insurance. Can I get contraceptives without their permission or telling them? You can go to see your doctor. The discussion that you have with your physician in the state of Minnesota is considered confidential for purposes of sexual health, mental health, and um, drug and alcohol abuse. Um, that does not mean that your parents may not know that you went to the doctor. They're obviously going to get a bill or a, you know a notice from insurance that you were there. But if they called up and said, you know, Dr. Vittorio, what did you talk about with my daughter? I would direct them towards you and having a discussion with you. So the reason we do that is because we want people who are having intercourse to be able to come in and get birth control and not feel like, oh, my parents are going to find out. I'm just going to end up getting pregnant anyway because I can't go and get birth control or I've got an STD. They can get treatment and you know we are not going to necessarily reveal things to their parents. If right. there's a situation where you're in danger, like you're being sexually assaulted and we do find out about that or something where it's important for other people to know for your own safety, that is the one reason we'll break confidentiality. Thank and you. I, I I would also add we you know we have planned parenthood here in yeah. in Duluth and most of their services are free. So if you are concerned because the, the bill will go to to your parents and and what the bill says is really not anything that we have any control over um, so that is that is an option um, and if you are pregnant and you want a free ultrasound the women's care center in downtown Duluth does a fantastic job with free ultrasounds okay great dr. Colin Dival we'll start with you on this one I've been on hormonal birth control for a long time how does this impact my risk for breast cancer cervical cancer etc yeah so l l a lot of studies had been done on it but there's not a very significant risk increase in like breast cancer risk or like cervical cancer risk. Uh, with hormonal contraceptives mainly it's more blood clots we see, but with regards to breast cancer, not necessarily so though. And it actually decreases your risk of ovarian cancer. Um, so we know that there are, are risk factors for and against uh, having ovarian cancer and, and being on the pill um, specifically for greater than 10 years decreases your risk of cancer of the ovary. Okay, thanks. Yeah, maybe I, I, I wanna add one more thing. So hormonal contraceptives is different than hormone replacement therapy. So that can increase the risk for breast cancer. Hormonal contraception, not necessarily so. Okay, thanks. Dr. Cassing, what uh, age do you, should you stop doing mammograms? 
So that is an area of great controversy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the most recon recent recommendation that I have read is either um, at age 74 or when the life expectancy is less than 10 years. And I, I, you know, what I counsel my patients on are, this is what the recommendation is. However, you are your own individual. And so if you are a very young 74 year old who has a very vibrant, active life, I tell people, you know, if you would treat a breast cancer at this point, if it, you discovered it, I would continue screening at least every other year. It Absolutely. doesn't necessarily have to be every year if you're in an advanced stage. Yeah. And if that's the key for, for any malignancy is if you would treat it, then, then you should be evaluated. Excellent. Dr. Vittorio, I saw on TikTok that tampons <laughs> can be toxic materials, can have toxic materials. What should I consider when shopping for hygiene products? Uh, I think it, it really depends. You know, we sort of look at sort of the exposure. Everything we use in the world is toxic. Everything is made of carbon, so it's sort of, you know, a judgment call. Um, these are products that do go in your body, but they don't necessarily stay in your body for long periods of time. Um, they're in general made of cotton um, and sterilized because we've dealt with toxic shock syndrome before, which is a staph infection caused by unsanitary um, feminine products. So I think it just really depends on what you are looking for and what your values are. You know, just like you would buy organic food at the grocery store, you would look at your tampons or your other products and say, well, what am I comfortable with? What am I not comfortable with? And that may involve looking at silicone cups um, as a way to control your menstrual flow, tampons or using pads or other materials. Okay, I'm really glad that that caller didn't just stick with TikTok and called in, <laughs> asked the doctor on that one. Um, Dr. Colin Dival, what genes are associated with breast cancer? So the major ones get talked about is the BRCA1 and 2. Mm -hmm. And now we know more, uh, more genes, CHEK2, PALB2. Uh, these are the common ATM. These are the common genes, uh, at least um, associated with the higher risk. And each gene can have different variants. And sometimes there are some variants we don't know the significance yet. And usually when someone has a strong family history, which means uh, a mom or a sister has breast cancer or the age when they develop a breast cancer, when they are less than 50 years old or an aggressive form of breast cancer, then we do do these testing. And uh, they do a much little bit elaborate panel of all the inheritable high risk gene mutations. So based on that, we can decide how the, sc how the screening could be. And this is one instance where sometimes we employ alternating ma mammogram and MRI every six months. So this is where the family history comes in when you see your primary doctor, whoever that might be, they ask you all those kinds of questions to find out your risk and then decide whether or not gene therapy or whatever other screening is appropriate for you. And most patients are referred to a genetic counselor, um, either via phone consultation through their insurance or in person, we do have genetic counselors in the area. Um, and that's really probably the best way to sort of get a good picture of the risk and get some of those testing that's needed covered. So if there is any question, then they're on to genetic counseling. Okay. Good. True. And, and I, w I would say, because we were talking about COVID earlier, that. Genetic counseling is one of the advances in telehealth as, as really mm -hmm. springboarded with, with COVID because we have several genetic counselors in the community and they were the first ones to jump on and say, all right, we can still do our job and the patient can be in their living room. Dr. Colin Devil, you can say something? Yeah, no, yeah, with genetic counseling, so once when the, f the first line of defense is always the primary care physician when they tell they're about the family history or anyone newly diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, prostate mm -hmm. cancer in the family, then uh, either they can refer to the oncologist or the genetic counselor. So we also send in those tests and uh, we also do some of the counseling part of it. Yeah. And, and depending on the results, it may affect your daughters, it may affect people down the road, and they may actually elect to have different procedures to either have a mastectomy or have, I mean, those are, those are kind of rare events, but it can affect others in your family, and so it's important to look at. Great. Uh, Dr. Cassie, what changes can I expect my body to go through during menopause? Um, there, there are many that are reported. Um, so the the major four symptoms of of menopause so when the ovaries stop producing estrogen are hot flashes night sweats sleep disturbances and vaginal dryness and almost every woman will report those four symptoms 
um, as far as cognitive changes, um, weight gain, fatigue, um, it's incredibly variable. But uh, at some point, almost everyone will have hot flashes and night sweats. Okay. Anything to add to that, Dr. Vittorio? Um, yeah, I mean, I think mood changes are something reported, and we're not necessarily sure if that's directly related to the hormone changes or if that's related to the lack of sleep and being irritable because you're uncomfortable all of the time. But, I mean, even women in their late 40s, 47, 48, who still have regular periods can experience these things. And I think the biggest thing is if your life is affected, talk to your primary doctor because there are non-hormonal things we can do to help people be more comfortable while their body makes that transition. And speaking of age, again, what is the cutoff for pap smear testing? At 80 years old, do I still need one, Dr. Vittorio? No. Um, so most of the time, if you've had normal pap smears and you um, have had, we're now doing dual testing. So we're doing testing for the human papillomavirus along with our pap smears. Most of the time you can stop at age 65 if they have been normal and you have a normal risk profile. And a normal risk profile would be most likely patients not on chemotherapy or immunosuppressive drugs, things that make you more prone to get viral illness. Um, those patients who don't fit sort of the normal profile may be recommended by their doctor to continue those at a, a different interval. But in general, healthy, disease-free people at 65 with normal history of pap smears can stop. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of cards on PCOS or questions on PCOS. So what are the symptoms of PCOS and how do I get tested for it? Yeah, so PCOS and endometriosis are probably the two most common things that we talk about in OBGYN, um, you know, other than pregnancy. And in, in general, women that have polycystic ovarian syndrome, there, there's kind of two presentations. One is, well, both presentations are irregular menses. Uh, meaning that it doesn't fit a regular cycle of every 28 days or every 30 days. Um, you may have acne, abnormal hair growth on your f face, chin, upper back. Um, also finding the uh, finding of multiple cysts on the ovary and ultrasound are, are the kind of the three diagnostic criteria. Um, the reason that is important is that number one, these patients oftentimes have difficulty getting pregnant. And once we diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome, we can control that. Um, and bring about regular menses and um, hopefully allow for pregnancy. Um, and then down the line, these patients have a high risk of diabetes. Okay. So being aware of that is certainly important. Um, anything to do to make sure it doesn't get worse, or what should they do to make sure it doesn't get worse? You know, a lot of it is, is lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the biggest things are weight loss. Um, and if you do have diabetes or prediabetes, controlling your, your blood glucose um, and then some of the stuff can be cosmetic as far as hair growth and acne, and we can help with all of those. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Vittorio again, sorry, Dr. Yeah. Colodival. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any STIs that women who um, have sex with women should be concerned about? Is it different from the STIs, se sexually transmitted infections, that can be transmitted from the penis and, vag and vaginal sex? Well, well, I would tell you that women who are with women get STDs. They may not get them at exactly the same rate, that someone who has penetrative sex um, with ejaculation gets just because of the exchange of body fluids is a little bit different with regards to sort of the physics. Um, but women who have sex with women get con gonorrhea, they get chlamydia, they get, um, you know, all of the STIs that we see. Um, and, you know, you can still get hepatitis or HIV if you are a lesbian. Um, so it's important to be screened and tested. Um, the presentations can be different depending on the type of intercourse that occurs, but there's really no reason why I would say I screen a lesbian woman different than I would, you know, a woman who has sex with men. Anything to add? No, I, I just think um, the most important thing is a frank conversation with your provider, whoever that may be, um, to discuss the symptoms and um, the history and, you know, that can lead to the evaluation. Okay, I think we have time for one more. We'll see how fast this one goes. Dr. Uh, Vittorio, what are the most effective contraceptions for preventing pregnancy? Well, there's a lot of them. I mean, obviously the most effective contraception is not to have sex, but people have sex and we know that. And so your most effective contraceptions are actually going to be our LARCs or our long, ass, our long acting implantable contraceptives such as an IUD. Um, and so they have a, you know, kind of a one to 2% failure rate with perfect use. Um, 
there are people who choose to use birth control pills, the effectiveness is less, lower in the 90s um, for that, and that's with perfect use, so that's you take your pill at the same time every single day and you never miss it, which we know people have life and that goes along. Um, kind of in between there is your um, you know, other sort of methods for pregnancy contraception, such as the ring. Um, we do have a Nexplanon or an implant that produces progesterone, which is fairly effective. Condoms are down there in the 80th, you know, one out of every four times you have sex with a condom, you're at risk for pregnancy. Yes, um, and I, I think that being in women's health, we always think about what what can the uh, what can the women do. But um, the vasectomy is is yep. the least invasive, um, and so we certainly recommend that. Um, and I would say I get paid to sterilize women, but the vasectomy is what we recommend. Um, and then taking out the fallopian tubes is the standard of care now. Um, both for permanent sterilization and to prevent uh, ovarian cancer in the future because it does increase, uh, decrease your risk of that. All right, excellent. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Michael Cassine, Dr. Krishna Kalandival, and Dr. Addie Vittorio, and our medical student volunteers, Rebecca Jacobs, Emily Clark, and Addie Ledesma. Please join Dr. Peter Nalen next week for a program on infectious disease and immunizations when his panelists will be Dr. Ken Ripp, Dr. Harmony Tyner, and Dr. Dylan Wyatt. Thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>